We finally got to see Michigan play a football game. I say I was about to say for the first time in 2024, but it's actually the third time we've seen Michigan play a football game in 2024. I digress. Nonetheless, Michigan wins against Fresno State 30 to 10. It wasn't necessarily confidence inspiring in a lot of ways, but I don't think it was nearly as dire as some might think. We're going to break down the game. Uh, I was going to say after having some time to digest it, but honestly, everything I'm going to tell you today is exactly uh, what I said (laughs) after the game or even during. So let's get to it all here on this episode of Lockdown Wolverines. You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Monday. We are back and doing it. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I am your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. And certainly, um, I know uh, some people are uh, revising their expectations for 2024. I say it's too early to really do that. And I know there's a lot of people out there that are going to take a look back and say, well, you can't, you can't beat Texas playing like that. That's accurate, but they weren't playing Texas last week. How many times have we kind of had to learn this lesson? Now, one of the things that I said after the game is I, I would have much rather had USC in week two and Texas in week four, because sometimes it takes the offensive line some time to kind of start gelling. And certainly we've seen that in the past. It was usually about week four. And I think back to 2018, not exactly here. People are trying to remember, but that's the first time that the offensive line suddenly looked good in the Jim Harbaugh era. Uh, And it it was week four against Nebraska that it was like, oh, okay, that offensive line is actually come to play. It's actually playing really good. Uh, So you would have liked to have had that. Uh, Texas obviously did a really good job playing Colorado State, which is a bad group of five team you remember michigan uh beating colorado state i don't remember the score offhand but it wasn't anything that was like revelation (laughs) it wasn't a revelation that was the Cade mcnamara uh start game right Let, let let me just go back real real quick to 2022 so yeah michigan did win 51 to 7 in that game texas ends up beating uh colorado state by a similar score uh, but that was where things really was, weren't working out like particularly amazing offensively, uh, yet Michigan managed to do a pretty good job in that one and, you know, had, uh, had a lot easier schedule. Uh, this year, there's not that room for error. So, unfortunately, you're going to have to face Texas with what you got. Let's start offensively. There, there were certainly some problems. Took a long time for the run game to start working. Offensive line got outplayed at times. It was disappointing. Uh, the pass game didn't exactly look prolific. So pretty much anything that you would take away from the offense that uh, that would be negatives were kind of what was happening in this game. So let's kind of go a little bit deeper here. Davis Warren obviously gets the start. Uh, and... I mean, he at one point he was eight for 10, but he had like 50 yards. So that's not great. Uh, a lot of that's on the play calling because Michigan seemed to want to go horizontal quite a bit, which is something that uh, I think we all kind of have wanted, but you still want to see them go vertical. I'm not sure how much of that was in part due to after he threw the interception, just kind of getting him back in rhythm. Because you keep in mind, he threw the interception on the second drive they had. First drive, they looked like the same, right? They just they got a, a quick defensive turnover, and then they march right down the field, get a touchdown, like a hot butter cutting through, a hot knife cutting through butter. Or also hot butter cutting through knife, whichever way you want to put it. But uh, it looked vintage. Didn't look any different. And then it, after the interception, an, an underthrown ball. Because they had, he had Fred Moore. If they would have put a little bit more air under it, that's a touchdown. And suddenly we're talking about things a lot differently. Uh, but uh, that didn't happen. So uh, it, it could have been better, yes. Offensive line could have been better. 
I understand you're a lot of you are concerned with Donovan Edwards. Uh, I would venture to say Donovan Edwards is concerned with himself a little bit. If, uh, well, there wasn't the holding call on Dom Judice that, you know, uh, that didn't call that long playback. Maybe we're talking about him differently as well, because that was really the only explosive play that would have been that. And just the lack of explosives is troubling in general. But uh, a lot of things weren't great. But I look at two different things. Number one, Michigan was extremely vanilla offensively. They weren't motioning like the way we were accustomed to seeing them doing. Everything was pretty much static. Play call to the line. The only motions you really saw were Ben Bredesen being in the slot and then motioning. Uh, otherwise, there, there wasn't a lot of those uh, pre-snap NFL-style uh, things going on, okay? So I feel like that is certainly going to change against Texas because that's one of the things that, uh, like Nick Saban's talked about, where Sharon Moore really thrives as an offensive coordinator was that it like this is an NFL offense and it comes with all of the types of NFL caliber things uh, along with it. So they're going to have to fix that. Uh, I wouldn't write off Davis Warren either because, yes, he is a walk-on. However, we've seen walk-ons kind of slowly get their start. Now, I, it's funny because I, I went back and looked at Setson Bennett, 2020. He, uh, he didn't start against Arkansas, but he finished against Arkansas, and he had almost 300 yards. I think he had uh, something similar the next week. Uh, but then after that, kind of fell off of a cliff, right? And keep in mind that Georgia went and got JT Daniels, and, uh, and JT Daniels ended up being the primary starter for them. Uh, Bennett had actually uh, thrown more, uh, had, had more attempts than JT Daniels, but uh, just about as many completions in eight compared to four games. So uh, it, it wasn't a good start for Stetson Bennett. Um, so I'm back at 2020. I'm looking at the game log here. You got 211 yards against Arkansas. Again, that was a game that Dwan Mathis started uh, against Auburn. He had 240, then 238, then 269. And then after that, 131, 78, 0, uh, and 12. In 2021, 288 against UAB, uh, only threw the ball three times against South Carolina and had four yards, uh, and then went back to being, uh, you know, splitting time and, and being, but being kind of more of a starter. 151, 72, 231, 250, 161, 255, so on and so forth, okay? So um, it wasn't until you get to the, uh, the week before Michigan against Alabama, they got 340 yards, 313 against Michigan, 224 in the national championship. Uh, win over Alabama. And then the next year is when he really took off and just suddenly had these incredible stat lines. You have to keep in mind, Michigan is built like Alabama. Sorry, not Alabama. Michigan is built like Georgia. They don't need him to necessarily, uh, as in Davis Warren, to be like this gunslinger. But he does need to be able to pass downfield to take the pressure off of the run game and to keep the defense from stacking the box. Because Fresno State mostly just stacked the box. Now, eventually, we did see them go downfield in the, uh, the final drive of, uh, of the game, and it worked pretty well. Colston Loveland, believe it or not, huge weapon. So uh, I expect them to do uh, some things there. I don't think Texas's defense is necessarily going to uh, – I don't think it's going to look any different that, than uh, you know, what we kind of saw from Fresno State. Fresno State's a really good group of five team. Uh, obviously, no, they're not in the same caliber as Texas, but I mean, this is a team that last year beat two power five teams, uh, went and beat a bad Purdue team, went and shut out a bad Arizona State team uh, on route to being nine and four. But this is the type of group of five team. This isn't uh, th this isn't like Miami of Ohio. I mean, they're actually a pretty good group of five team, but this isn't like a Mac school. This is a this is a team that could actually find themselves in the playoff once everything is said and done this year. Um, I know hard to believe when I, that I could put it that way, but with a group of five team, at least one getting in, uh, Fresno state would be one of the choices that I would look at and say, they got as good a shot as any. So I would not underestimate that. And I think that Michigan will find some ways offensively, uh, to be a little bit more complicated. I feel like they were holding a lot of stuff back, felt like they could win the game without having to kind of show their hand. Because it's not always about the hand that you were dealt. 
right? It's the collection of hands that you're dealt. So you don't want to go all in on the first hand when you know maybe that second hand might be where you're going to make a little bit more money. You know what I mean? So we will see uh, as far as that goes. But let's talk about the defense because the defense I thought was absolutely astounding. There were some areas where it was like, that didn't look great. But at the same time, it's, uh, I mean, uh, there's zero concern on my end. So we'll get to that here in just a moment. But before we do, listen, right now that as I'm, as I'm recording, it's after lunch. I'm sure you are tired. Uh, granted, it's Labor Day, so maybe, maybe you're not working like I am. But either way, Labor Day or not, you're not alone. In fact, research shows that more than 70% of us hit the wall after lunch, so let a five-hour energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it. Five Hour Energy is the brand hardworking people like you have trusted for over 20 years to give them the alert, energized feeling they need to get through a busy, hectic day. You always know where to find your Five Hour Energy shots right at the cash register at nearly every convenience drug and grocery store nationwide. Stock up on money-saving multi-packs to make sure you never run out of delicious, energizing Five Hour Energy shots. So if you go to fivehourenergy.com, that is the number five and uh, fivehourenergy.com and get some five hour energy product today, you can use my promo code LOCKDOWNCFB to receive 20% off of your order. This offer is valid only until September 30th on one order and cannot be used in conjunction with any other promotions. This code is also not good on subscription orders. So go to fivehourenergy.com today. You might be able to hear a little pitter-patter here and there throughout, and that's because Zuri keeps coming in and out of the room. Because I opened a couple windows. It's very fall-like outside, uh, weather-wise. So I'm like, you know what? I don't, it's cold in here. I'm just going to you know, turn the air off, open the windows. For a dog that wants to be outside like 100% of the time, uh, it's amazing how she doesn't want outside coming in. She does not like the windows being open. It's very troublesome for my electric bill. But she keeps on coming in and out of the room just because she's... He's not happy with that. Um, anyway, uh, defensively, there, there certainly were some moments where it looked troubling, mostly Will Johnson. Uh, weirdly, it was his worst game, uh, I think, as a Wolverine until he got the pick six. And uh, certainly when you see uh, him getting kind of picked on, that's, we've, we've never seen that before. We've never seen Will getting picked on except for in his very first game, which also happened to be against Colorado State. The touchdown, the seven out of that 51 to seven that I mentioned, came from Will Johnson. Now, he didn't give up any touchdowns here. The touchdown came on Jaden McBurrows in, in as a reserve. Uh, and you, don't, you, you look at the, uh, the passing numbers for Mikey Keene, and it, it, it doesn't inspire confidence. 22 36 for uh, 235 yards. He had one touchdown and two interceptions. I mean, four interceptions, kind of. <laughs> so. Which I called, by the way, I called the the, the latter interceptions. Uh, but ultimately, I thought this was an incredible uh, first showing by the defense. Uh, yeah, ten isn't as good as seven, which I believe was not just the number last year, but the, or two years ago. But I believe that that's kind of where they were at uh, each the several last year. So, like I said, fifty fifty one to seven uh, a couple years ago, thirty to three last year. Um, 47 to 14 against Western Michigan. Um, and then, you know, you have to go back and middle Tennessee 40 to 21. This, this is, this game was not nearly as troubling in my eyes as middle Tennessee in 2019, but you know, could things end up being like 2019? Absolutely. But I, I did not take that away in large part. It's because the defense was so good. Two sacks for Josiah Stewart, who was an absolute beast. Jay Sean Barham was insane. Like, he's not showing up on the stat sheet the same way as uh, a lot of others are, right? Like, I look at the stat sheet here. Jay Sean Barham had a total of two tackles, one solo, one assist. But, I mean, that guy was an absolute monster out there. Ernest Hausman played very good. I mean, they really rotated very heavily in this game. And I thought that they were just absolutely phenomenal with what they were able to do with, uh, with this defense. Uh, yeah, a little over aggression with uh, some backup players out there led to the sole touchdown by Fresno State. I, again, am not worried, right? Like, 
Fresno State did not have Michigan, quote, figured out the way that other teams had Don Brown figured out. That's not what was happening. But they, again, were tinkering, and it felt like on both offense and defense, they were trying to figure out ways to, like, just, like, hey, this is in-game. Fresno State's a tough team. We, we will win this game, but we need to figure some things out before Texas. That was the impression that I got. And I, I had had some conversations before the game with some some staff members, and uh, this is going back to the offensive side of the ball, but they were they were saying like they were pleasantly surprised by the offense and felt like it was better than they expected and that they were feeling pretty good. And then we didn't see that necessarily in the game, uh, but the defense is going to keep Michigan in every game. So uh, unless there's just... Uh, unless like the the Will Johnson problems that ended up happening in this game, if if that's just like a sign of something, then okay. If that's an omen, then maybe the defense isn't as good as we think. But Fresno State is known more so for its offensive prowess, and Michigan held Fresno State to a grand total of uh, nine yards rushing and two hundred thirty five yards passing. Nine yards rushing. As Sharon Moore said earlier today in the press conference, Texas wants to run the football. Everyone talks about their passing, but they want to run the football. They ran the football 41 times against Colorado State. They want to do ball control and then play off of that with play action. I mean, it was impressive, I thought, that Fresno State just kept on trying to run the ball as much as they did because they were getting nothing outside of one or maybe two plays. They got nothing on the ground. But you love what you saw out of that defensive front you love what you saw out of the middle. You love what you saw out of most of the back end. I mean, it's what's not to like, really, for this Michigan defense. So that kind of brings us back to offense. Can it do what it needs to do in order to uh, beat a team like Texas? Let's look forward to Texas and what that game, how do I think that game would go as of right now? Let's do that here in just a moment. But before we do, hey, Lockdown Wolverines fans, I want to take a moment to give you a heads up on a brand new mobile game that I think you are going to love just as much as I do, Ultimate College Football HC. In this amazing game and simulation, you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your football team to glory. Can you imagine actually being the head coach at Michigan? From recruiting players and hiring coaching staff to overseeing training camps and handling school scholarships, you control every crucial detail of your program. It's all in your hands. Will you be able to handle the pressure? Here's what I really love about the game. You're responsible of calling or responsible for calling offensive plays during the games. Your strategy will not only determine the success of your football season, but will shape the future and legacy of your program. Ultimate College Football HC is completely free. It has no ads and 100% playable offline. You can play when you are on the go as you want and when you want to. And, of course, we have a special uh, offer here for Lockdown Wolverines fans. Use the promo code LOCKDOWNCFB, all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost to your program. Make sure you take advantage of it because it will get your team off to a strong start. So to download the game, just visit ultimate-cfb.com or look it up on the App Store. Ultimate College Football HC, begin your coaching legacy today. I'm looking down beneath the desk here, and there's just a, a, a puppy that's looking at me, very, very unsure of what's going on with all these confounded windows open. There's only two windows open. <laughs> there is extremely confident, and like she like loves fireworks and barks at them. She used to bark at the thunder. Now she's afraid of thunderstorms, but now it, now she's a little scaredy cat. She doesn't want to. Doesn't want windows open she doesn't want to hear the breeze or feel the breeze unless she's actually out there very confusing dog all right so texas obviously is a daunting task right it's a huge game biggest in college football next week been a long time since uh, michigan's had the early biggest game in college football right those games have come later more more so often at least middle of the season you think 2022 penn state michigan hadn't played anybody up until that point Ohio State, obviously. I mean, Washington was supposed to be big in 2021, didn't go that way. Uh, obviously, all the Notre Dame games in the past uh, were it. Not, but 
it's been a long time. It used to be regular Notre Dame week two, week three. That was uh, the biggest game in college football, uh, but that, that hasn't been going, right? They they played a couple times, 2018, 2019. 2019 was late in the season. Um, other than that, I mean, they hadn't played uh, since 2014. So uh, it's been rare that there's that big marquee game early in the season for Michigan anymore. So for Texas to come to town and you hear Matthew McConaughey's coming, and all of that, like it's it, it just couldn't be bigger, and uh, that's I think kind of why Michigan was tinkering a little bit, cycling guys in and out both sides of the ball. You saw a lot of receivers play, you saw a bunch of linemen play, and then defensively a lot of other people come in and play as well. Because Michigan, I feel, was again aware it was going to win the game as long as it just did what it at you know was capable of, which it did ultimately just failed to cover the spread by a a point. Shro not going for two upsetting a lot of people, but I could have told you probably don't take the, don't take Michigan (laughs) if I was betting that game. Um, I think that uh, you're trying to prepare people. Like you want to see what guys are going to do in this moment under the lights uh, against a team that they should beat a tough group of five, uh, five team. Again, I'm not saying they're tough uh, to just try to make Michigan sound better. It's just a tougher group of five team. This isn't what Michigan played last year. You know, this isn't the Hawaii's of the world. This isn't uh, Northern Illinois. This isn't, uh, I don't even know who they played last year, but this isn't UConn. I have to harken back to two years ago, apparently. That's not those types of teams, right? These were, this was a much tougher group of five opponents. And I think that that was kind of a good audition just to be able to see if we, if we have to throw Miles Pollard out there, how does it look? You know, if, if, we, if we're going to tinker a little bit, who, you know, can this guy do what this guy is going to do? I wonder if they have a participation port on, on, on this uh, box score. They don't. They used to have that on there. But it, I feel like they, they figured out quite a bit as to what they have. And you saw some really good things. You saw guys like Jimmy Roller making plays. Like, all right, cool. The guys that were supposed to make plays defensively pretty much did all the way throughout. Zeke Barry talked about constantly throughout the offseason. Uh, even if they didn't count, Quentin Johnson, Makari Page, both of them, big plays in the moment. Uh, Will Johnson ultimately has the dagger after having his worst game. To that point, Jay Sean Barham and Ernest Hausman look beastly. Mason Graham looks beastly. Uh, the edge rushers look beastly. TJ Guy looked great. Had the weakest wash, <laughs> weakest uh, roughing the passer I have seen ever. But he was part of what created that pressure uh, on that second uh, interception that wasn't uh, there. So I, I guess, you know, whatever. Uh, you do want to see more from the receivers. Tyler Morris, 3 of 15. The long of nine, uh, you you want to see more from him. Uh, the kind of jogging on that that play, I mean, that should have been a touchdown. Uh, he he had a step on the guy, but just kind of jogged. Um, but I I think you saw good things from him. You saw good things from Kendrick Bell, who gets out there, uh, one catch for eleven yards. I'd like to see Samaj used more. Uh, they obviously targeted Frederick more on the uh, interception. I think they could be more creative with Donovan Edwards. Certainly, they they tried a little bit. Uh, but I think that there are some bones here. And uh, we can only go off of what we see, but I'm going to make an educated guess that what we saw was nothing compared to what we will see. But then it's on Michigan to uh, to do something with it because they could – certainly run out there and have all kinds of different uh, games and schemes and uh, be what much more creative with the play calling, uh, go more vertical than horizontal, but still work in the horizontal and, you know, get some Aj Morgan involved in that and do certain things that, that make you kind of go, okay. But if they don't execute those things, then it's all for naught. And that was kind of part of the problem here is a kind of a lack of execution except for, First drive, last drive in the first half, last drive of the game. So really only three drives really kind of worked for Michigan. So um, with that in mind, Dominic Zavada, an absolute beast. Field goals of 45, 53, and 53. Absolutely phenomenal. 
Uh, so, uh, but you're going to need to score touchdowns on Texas, and you're going to need to hold them to field goals. You're, you're right back into the boa constrictor uh, of it all. Can Michigan be that? I think it can. I mean, it's certainly the defense is right there. Uh, so it's just a matter of the offense holding serve. And I think that they have that capability, but I, you, your guess is as good as mine as far as that. I'm not overly concerned yet. One game, one data point, not overly concerned. If I'm an Oregon fan, even though Dylan Gabriel threw for like 8,000 yards, yeah, I'd be a little concerned. Like, it's, it's easy to get hyperinflated or deflated after week one. Like, if I'm a Purdue fan, I'm probably really inflated. Hudson Card went 24 for 25, looked amazing. Yeah, but then when Purdue plays a team with a pulse, maybe it's different. Michigan shows up bigger in big moments. Players like Donovan Edwards show up bigger in big moments. We've seen Donovan Edwards. The biggest stages, Ohio State, college football playoff, the national championship game. Donovan Edwards goes off. Penn State goes off against the, uh, the whatever teams. Uh, he just kind of just doesn't. So my concern will come with a loss, of course. But as of right now, I'm not concerned. I'm intrigued. And I have questions. And that's fine. You know, people are going to say, the way Michigan played in week one, that's not going to beat Texas. You're absolutely right. But have we not learned? I understand. New players, new staff, lots of different things. Have we not learned that you're not to judge <laughs> one game and, set, and try to transitive property that over to another one? Every year we do this. Every single year. Michigan against Rutgers in 2021. Well, you're not going to beat Ohio State playing like that. Well, no, they weren't. And they weren't playing Ohio State. Michigan is not in the business of being Ohio State, which is to go out and clown everybody by 70 points. That's what Ohio State does. Michigan will, Michigan will beat you 6-3 to three if it can. Okay? So, just be patient. Everything will come out. And, you know, again, maybe, maybe Michigan gets blown out. We'll find out. None of the four potential outcomes would surprise me on Saturday. Blowout win, blowout loss, close win, close loss. None of them. So it's up to Michigan to find ways to uh, make that work in their favor. Because they have the element of surprise to some degree. Texas doesn't have that. We know what Texas is. They're, we, it's the same thing as it was. So it'll be interesting to see what Michigan does come Saturday. All right, that's going to do it for us today. We'll be back on Tuesday. So thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. We will talk to you again soon. Peace.